And then, um, maybe we should let Braden do it. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started. Great crowd, great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, just one second with the lights, Bill. Thank you. Premature. Uh, work there. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Peg from the Conservation Advisory Council. We have a number of CAC members here. We have Donald LaMonica here. We have Bill O'Neill. And who else is here? Where is Tyler? Tyler Fogg. Yeah, great. And uh, a couple of our members are traveling. They're just not here today. So um, I just want to ask a couple of housekeeping things. Please make sure to print your name on the sheet. We just want to know who's here. And um, please take a handout that Bill's giving out. On that handout is highlighted Donald LaMonica's email. I know he's thrilled with this. Um, and we're going to ask everyone who wants testing or who has water questions to please email us. It's our best way of keeping a database. So that, that really works well and we're very, very responsive. Um, so a couple of other housekeeping notes. We're announcing we are filming this. Um, we, we didn't have anyone to work um, meetings on Zoom that people can come in, but we are filming it. So we're gonna put it on YouTube for the other residents who could not make it. And we'll share it with anybody. Um, thanks to Michelle. I don't know where she went. She's been amazing and helpful. We are so blessed in New Lebanon to have such a great librarian. Um, mm -hmm. we, we appreciate that. We ask that you hold your questions until we take breaks. There's going to be quite a bit of information. There's Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Um, until we take some breaks and we'll have questions at the end. I'm pretty sure the information that you guys are going to want is going to be covered in the talk. But if it isn't, please ask your questions during the talk. And if we don't get to it, I ask again that you email us and we will be sure to answer you. Um, we also ask that you reach out to CAC directly. Um, this project has been going on for quite a while. I know some people are new to different things in town and we've been working on this really since 2017. So there's been a lot of going on with it. So uh, please um, take a look at the CAC uh, webpage on the town um, website and look at, at other information we have there. Um, the town clerk can also forward your information. If you don't have any of our emails, send your questions to the town clerk and she will send it to us. Um, our meetings are the second Monday of the month at 6.30 at town hall. Please come. We can use the help. We can use the information. Uh, we are always looking for help and, and questions to be answered um, and get involved with what we're doing. Um, they're also live streamed. Many of you know that um, on town hall streams. They're also recorded. Our meeting minutes are also on the town website so you can see what we're doing and get up to speed and contact any of us. We're a pretty friendly bunch. Um, we have a natural resource conservation plan that we've been uh, using since 2017. It's our blueprint for what we do in the town. And also the source water plan is on the town website. And you can also get one printed if you ask the town clerk. And it's all on the town website. Um, it's also, there's copies here at the library as well. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, our guest today. We have MJ from New York Rural Water right here. She's been our uh, lifeline. New York World Water is our advisor and our major help on this. And we have two wonderful guys from the Department of Health, Braden and Martin. And we've been working with them since 2021. We participated in a pilot program for starting water testing around the state. And that was super successful. We did 21 wells and we're kind of continuing that. Um, so um, we're all volunteers. You probably know that. Hey, Tom, nice to see you. We're all volunteers, and last year we put in over 100 hours on this, just on this project, and we have many other projects going. So we're pretty committed to the town and helping the residents. Um, you may not know the CAC has been around for about 13 years. It was uh, came about as a result of uh, the 2005 comp plan in the town. Many towns up in Columbia County now have conservation advisory councils. Um, I'm just going to say part of the mission of the CAC, because some of you may not be familiar, um, is to gather and disseminate information, conduct research, and advise the town agencies on matters related to the conservation of natural resources within the town. 
The CAC considers issues of air quality, surface water and groundwater quality and quantity, soils, plants, wildlife, and habitats um, of conservation concern. So we are an advisory council, but when needed, we are active and we're activists. And this is one of the activist things we're doing. Um, I wanna give a huge thank you to the residents that have participated so far. We started the well water testing in 23 and we've tested over 70 wells so far, combined with the 2021 testing with over 90. Um, so we are getting quite a good database. Um, free water testing is continuing. Uh, water testing, as you're going to hear today, is our, one of the major ways to keep track of what's going on in people's wells and also all over town. We are a town of all wells. We have no municipal water. Everything's in a well. Um, so Donald's going to be sharing what we test for and why, and Tyler's going to be sharing info on wells and septics. And um, understand we're at the very beginning of our work. So the testing is going to be ongoing. Testing is our way to make sure your wells are safe and what's going on with the source water. There's never been a study of source water in town. You guys do the math. Hey, nice to see you, Karen. Hey, nice, hi everybody, nice to see everybody. Um, so New Lebanon is a pretty old town. You guys who've been here a while, uh, a lot of us know there's been a lot of things going on on the surface of the uh, soil and all that goes down. So we're looking into all of it. This is a very long-term study. This is not gonna be done soon. Um, all you have to do is look at these great maps around to see the very complicated water system we have in New Lebanon. I think if these highways weren't here, this would probably be underground, underwater is my guess. I think this would be all part of the swamp. So I think we have a lot of water issues here. Um, there's been a lot of different land uses. Again, something we need to explore. We really need your help. We need the town's help to help us figure out what we're doing and where and what to look at. Um, keeping our sources protected now is crucial for now and into the future. Um, so now on to the program, I'm gonna turn it over to Donald. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. I'm Donald LaMonica, CAC member. Uh, I'm going to speak about our water testing program. You know, as Peg said, we're a town of all, all wells, and our testing is out there uh, just to get a sense of if there are any issues with particular wells. Uh, and we do three kinds of tests. Uh, right now, the, the short version is for coliform bacteria, E. coli, and for nitrates. Uh, we also have a, a full slate of testing that, that we can get done at our lab, but we reserve that. We have been reserving it uh, for people and residences where they assume that they may have a, a bigger problem that we anticipate. As you'll see in the, around the room on our slides here, coliform and E. coli are pretty common around the state. Uh, uh, coliform is, is found in about 40% of the world, so it's nothing out of the ordinary if you turn up with a, a positive test. And there are many ways uh, to rectify this. That's later on in the program. So what I want to say now is that uh, when, in the spring again, we will reinstitute our, our testing program. Uh, like Peg said, you can find my email address on the wall here somewhere or contact the town clerk and we will put you into list of homes that we'd like to test and, and figure out at some point in the spring when we will be out there again. Uh, what we've been doing is picking a day or two and giving residents a choice of times uh, that we will be out there. And we try to do well, nine or 10 per day to make it worthwhile. We have a time restriction on when we must turn in our water samples. Uh, so there, there, there is a little restriction on when we do it. And pretty much that's, that's where we are. What, what we really do need is your participation. If you contact us, we can move forward with this program. And I think we have, we've always, we've had a good response and I assume we, we will get more. But anyway, take a look at our materials and you find our contacts and we are always amenable to answer questions going forward with whatever, whatever you need. Uh, and, and one more thing is, why do we want to control the testing? Why are we doing this? Why, well, first of all, it, it keeps the cost down and 
it gives us a firsthand view of what what is out there. We we get to see where we may think there there are problems, <laughs> and then this data will go into the water source protection plan, and someone else who knows a lot more than than we do will come up will come up with some answers for us. And I guess at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Mary to Theresa Julianne from the Rural Water. The CAC has been working with rural water since 2015, is that right? 2017. My predecessor did a lot of this work for the plan here. Um, you'll see these maps on the wall. Um, we take a look at a lot of the underlying physical characteristics of the town. So bedrock geology will tell you um, a lot of types of contaminants that might leach into the water um, can be determined by bedrock geology and soils. Um, also, well yields tend to uh, vary with uh, the type of geology and the depth of the well. Um, so these are interesting to take a look at. Our program is a um, funded by the Farm Service Administration. We're a nonprofit, but um, we work with money provided by the um, Farm Service Administration. Um, a little background on the program in general. In um, the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1986 is what um, started this effort uh, in, I'm sorry, 74. In 86, there was a um, amendment, some amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act of 74 and um, in then again in 96. In 86, um, there was a wellhead protection um, program that started and Rural Water has been working with the wellhead protection program since 96, or 86 in 96, um, the EPA uh, mandated that all of the states do a source water assessment for all of their wellheads. So all the regulated wells. And in here, you don't have municipal water, but you do have some regulated wells. If you have a um, community that has that serves over 25 people, you have to um, have your water tested to make sure that it's safe for the residents. So these would be large apartment complexes, mobile home parks, and whatnot. People who rent who don't really have control over you know whether the water is safe or not, um, just to keep an eye on things and make sure that it is safe. Um, so the source water assessments were done by New York State. They have primacy for that, and they were done between 1999 and 2004. So all of the wellheads have a source water assessment that has been done by the community systems. We call them. Um, community water systems. And um, right now, New York State is um, has an, an effort to uh, redo them and take a look and update the original swaps from the early 2000s. So New Lebanon is also working on that. Uh, it's called the DWSP2. It's a drinking water source protection plan. That's the New York State efforts to update the swaps from the uh, 96 Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, that's just some background on how we got where we are now. And what we're doing is, whoops, if we could go back one more. Sorry, that was a long-winded slide. <laughs> um, can we go back away? Thank you. So this is basically the um, format of the DWSP2. But um, again, Rural Water has been doing pretty much the same thing since 96. The first part um, we did here was you will form a stakeholder group. In this case, in New Lebanon, it's the CAC um, is acting as a stakeholder group. Uh, you go through and you establish critical areas for um, where the source water is drawn from for all of the wellheads. So again, in your case, it's community wells. That would be the uh, mobile home parks. I think you have five in the town. Um, and then once you have the, the area where your water is drawn from, so that means under the ground, right? So the well goes down into the ground, and then um, there's an area under the ground where <coughs> the water is pulled into the well under the ground. Um, basically, you know, what happens is anything that happens on top of the ground 
any land uses that could be um, potential contaminants can impact the water. So that's what we're looking at. We go through and we inventory all the potential contaminants. And um, then the, once that process is all complete, um, that's a lot on our side. Then we work more closely with the, uh, the stakeholders and develop uh, protection methods, implementation, um, and DWSP2 looks more, is folding more of this into um, their plans right now than the original swaps had. So part of the management that as it, as it moves into the hands of the um, stakeholder group and the management team, um, we look at funding um, for implementation and try to help you out there and a timeline. So these things have a timeline and then they'll be updated too from time to time. So these are considered living documents. Um, okay, another long winded slide, thank you. <laughs> so the goals that the stakeholder group came up with are identify water supply resources and potential threats, recommend and implement protection strategies to protect the identified water sources. And the vision statement for the plan is seek to further develop its water resources, planning, and management strategies in order to protect drinking water resources. So that was our starting point. <coughs> you need yes, a clicker. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I need to talk to my clicker. <laughs> um, so uh, again, like we looked at a lot of the physical characteristics in establishing the critical protection areas. Um, and mainly, you know, it was the what we did for this in this case was a uh, fixed radius. So from the um, five public or community water systems, we did a, a drew a one hundred or one mile radius around those. And then there's also um, transient um, and non-transient. So you have the schools systems, right? And um, those would be non-transient or okay. <laughs> but the, um, and then the restaurants and whatnot that serve uh, over 25 people are the transient side of the community system. So around those systems, we do a 150-foot uh, radius, and that determines the area that we're, we're we want to make sure that we focus some efforts on if there are land uses or contaminants of concern in those areas. And then next slide, please. So when we do the potential contaminant inventory, we look at a lot of publicly available GIS data, um, data sets, um, GIS, federal, county, state um, agencies typically will do their inventory management in their GIS files so that we have a lot of great data. So for regulated potential contaminants, we have things like underground storage tanks that we, we map out and look at and see you know, where they are in proximity to other physical features. Landfills, CAFOs you do not have here, so those are the um, contained animal feeding operations, um, which can have a lot of loadings in agricultural areas from the number of uh, animals um, and waste products. Gas or oil wells, and speedies discharges. So there's sort of, uh, the uh, outlets for in industrial activities and other things. Uh, so we looked at local knowledge too. We would like to try to pull in anything that the community members know about that aren't necessarily in the, the data and compile those into a GIS. So this is a map um, I cannot take credit for, but my predecessor did do this. So these are the, the blue and the green are the, um, the areas that were defined as the source water protection area for the community systems. Um, and then the wastewater discharges are on there. The, there. We took a look here, and this is the local knowledge at the Bouchard and the Sarnama Seal and the Old Landfill in particular. Um, we did some testing there with residents to make sure that their water was not impacted by those. Um, and DOH people can talk about that in more detail if you have questions. Uh, same information there. That's, that's the map that was outputted for the potential contaminant inventory. Um, this I can't take credit for, so if you don't like it, <laughs> that's my fault. No, but anyways, I, what I wanted to do is show you just basically the terrain here in New Lebanon. You have along um, 
the the green and the purple are your sand and gravel aquifers. So sand and gravel aquifers have um, a, a lot of uh, permeability and water and contaminants potentially can travel through to the aquifer very quickly because of the nature of the um, physical substrate there. What you have in New Lebanon is that uh, along the Route 22 and 20 corridor are pretty much all of your potential contaminant land uses are in that area. And then it's also compounding that it's also a sand and gravel aquifer. So the purple and the green are the aquifers. Um, then we have the potential contaminants on there again. And it's also in a flood zone. So the hatched area is uh, the flood zones. So it's, it's a sensitive area for sure. Um, it's all low lying. You have a lot of relief and topography in here in New Lebanon, but uh, that's that's in a real low lying area. Um, and then next slide. Uh, at the so moving through, you know, those steps in the plan. Now we're looking at priority issues and the priority issues that were identified for New Lebanon. Um, investigating further on the potential contaminants. Um, water quality in the Route 2022 business district. I think this has been an ongoing concern in the town for quite a long time. Uh, increased community support for awareness of the importance of water protection, which is part of what we're doing today here. So uh, access potential drinking water impacts resulting from climate hazards. Now um, you have a, another community committee that's working with the CIC and you're, you're working on a climate Hazard mitigation plan with the climate, county. climate smart, climate smart right. community, and then you also have a hazard mitigation plan with the county. Right, right. we're all working together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have a lot of different um, efforts that are kind of dovetailing here. Uh, critical environmental areas. Um, two environmental areas have been designated uh, throughout the course of developing this plan. You have a cool ravines area, and then you have the Shaker Swamp. Right. This, those are your two areas and monitoring and testing. So just find out more about the quality of the water in the town. So next slide, please. All right, so just to zoom out a little bit and give you um, kind of a picture of this isn't, you know, plan specific per se, but just to give you a picture of how your water is flowing in New Lebanon. This, the green here is uh, New Lebanon and the pink, what, what you're seeing there is um, the watershed or the drainage area for the Kinderhook Creek. So all of the water in New Lebanon drains to the Kinderhook Creek. Um, just as a zoom out snapshot kind of an idea. So the Stony Kill, for instance, all of the water here drains that way. What a, a drainage area does, these are sub basins. This is one big Kinderhook Creek basin and these are all sub basins. And a drainage area is defined by uh, going along the topography along the ridge line, and um, anything that falls this way goes into that drainage area. Anything that falls this way from the um, drainage divide goes into a different sub basin. So the stony kettle here you have in New Lebanon, and this all eventually drains down into the Stockport Creek, and uh, it drains into the Kinderhook Creek rather um, at the confluence of, of three watersheds. These um, this drains here into the Kinderhook Creek, so all of your water here from the White Amanok Creek and the, the South Branch, is it? North Branch? Uh, South Branch, it must be. Um, drain here into the Kinderhook Creek there. The Takawasik, I might not be saying your names right, but uh, <laughs> Kinderhook Creek uh, comes from two different sides and drains into the Kinderhook Creek. Uh, so you have four different watersheds in actually five different subsheds in New Lebanon, but they all drain to the Kinderhook Creek. So when you do have your, you'll see here the Route 22, 20 corridor, um, all of your potential contaminants, you know, will be Nassau's problem, basically. So that's, that's not something, you know, that is addressed per se in the plan, but it is a consideration. Yeah, whenever possible, can you just point out the Stony Creek? Sure. Um, I believe what we what we have here for the 2022 is. Um, tell me if I'm wrong here, Peg. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yep. So yep. it's right. It it uh, joins the Kinder Creek in here, and so the 20 
2022 is here, right? No, so, so 22 yeah. goes north south, and, and then 2022 just shares that little bit in the middle. Okay. It's a it's a much smaller view. If you look here, guys, it is a very small view. Right, you can see here um, on these maps um, the 2022 corridor is this small area right here on this right, map. Right. So 22 goes north here, 20 goes this way, and then the corridor is just a small bit. So this is the 2022 corridor. That's quote, quote unquote corridor. That's the business district. I'm sorry, I was wrong here too. It's right here, guys. It's right here, right. up to sort of Lovers Lane, where where 22 goes south is the end of it. Sorry about that. Right you want to see it? The light is here. Thank you. And then you do have a, a cluster of potential contaminants um, or you know land uses that could cause problems to your water um, in West Lebanon down in here too. So and it's all very wet. You know, it's a very wet area. Everything kind of whoosh, drains down into that that one area. Thank you. Uh, so we've been working on implementation throughout the plan. The DOH people have been helping, you know, look at the water quality. Um, and uh, I'll let you guys talk further about that. Um, and like Peg said, you know, there'll be further studies. This is this is an iterative process. So this is kind of like a first pass at collecting everything and um, moving forward. You know, you can build on this, but it kind of is a nice blueprint for where to start looking. Um, it's like so. <coughs> Right, this is what you were oh, talking about before. I, yeah. I, I maybe got moved because I thought it was. Yeah. Sorry. That was my long word. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what to do again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, there's been a lot of um, participation here, and a lot of partnerships um, have helped along the way. And I think you know, the the more people you get on board, the stronger you know anything is so uh there are a lot of people to think i'll let you you know get into details here but a lot of people have helped in different ways um and then the next slide i guess that's it yes great so okay. lights can come on and we can have questions for mj now if you have any and also about the water testing if you guys have any are you presenting okay any questions yeah yeah if if it was a test uh, positive, or what's the next step? So the DOH people um, will yeah. work with um, with people. Now the thing about the what you have is about ten percent of your population are in the community water systems in New Lebanon, and then the ninety percent, the rest of the ninety percent are all individual water supplies. So the individual water supplies are not regulated by New York State. It's up to the homeowner, you know, to test if they want or not. And then any kind of um, remediation that might be needed there, DOH will, is happy to help with, with and guide people, right? Um, and, and we give advice too. So, um, and we've been advising a lot of people just to answer that because I know that was discussed somewhere um, that uh, we advise a lot of people uh, to retest in two to three weeks to see what the contamination looks like. We had a lot of rain this summer. We have a very high water table right now. There's a lot of movement going around the water. So we do recommend retesting in a few weeks. And if that still shows positive, we're recommending, we have no personal stake in any company, but uh, UV filters and a sediment filter, a full house sediment filter, um, which is fairly inexpensive and UV filtration. Uh, that's where we're going with all this, I believe because we're a whole a town of all individual wells. And I think we're seeing now that we live in nature. We're a very rural town. And so nature is peeing and pooping where we live. So I think it's very important that we all protect ourselves with a UV filter. It's a fairly easy thing to do and many people in town are doing it. Uh, but we can, will help you. We're help, we help answer questions and point people. Is the testing available to everybody out in the the whole town of New Lebanon. No, these are these are great questions. The whole town of New Lebanon. Um, what happened is the town approved ARPA money 
for water testing. Um, with a survey of town residents a couple years ago, water testing was high, water quality was high on the list. So the town designated $30,000 for water testing. So we are spending that money for free tests to help get a picture. One of the reasons we're doing the testing is so we get the results. So you understand the results are confidential. Only you and I know what the results are per location. You are free to share those results with anybody, but we don't talk about them unless uh, we need to. And if somebody needs to contact us about it, we will reach out to the homeowner and figure out how to work that. So the results are confidential. We are doing aggregate results. It's too early now to see what's going on, really. So, one more. yeah. So, are we testing? Right. So what Donald said. So we're we're starting with the three with nitrate and E. coli and coliform. But if people have other concerns, we will do more on the back of the sheet we gave out. It gives you a physical and chemical analysis that we can do. And then we, for example, we tested off the brownfield downstream of the brownfield. We did test PCBs. So those tests are quite expensive. So we're being judicious. We haven't had a need for some of those tests. But if people feel there's a need, we will examine it and we will do it. So uh, it's just very site specific, you know. Um, but yes, so yeah. I think Tom has hand up first. Yeah. Peg, I just wanted to ask if one uh, has transferred a house, has bought a house within, you know, some number of years or decades, is the test that New Lebanon does for free pretty much the same test that one might have done as a real estate transfer? I, I don't know. Some I don't know what they do. I can't speak to that. But uh, bacteria is certainly high on everybody's list. Yeah. Um, and I just want to assure everybody, I know there was a comment, I believe, um, on a group on Facebook that was worried about testing in New York. So they tested in Massachusetts. You know, that doesn't help us here, first of all. Second of all, your results are your results. There is nothing on your property. This is a private well situation. It's up to you and your seller to, if you have a problem with your well and your, and your buyer uh, wants to know what the well is, you know, you have an obligation to tell them or they should test themselves. But it's not, there's nobody sharing information. There's no, uh, nothing hard uh, damaging for you with these tests. It's just for your information. We want to keep everyone healthy. And obviously we have a long haul here because this has been going on. We know a lot of issues have been going on for a while. Yeah. Sorry, what is the brown field that you were referring to? Uh, right over here off of the uh, theater barn property. Uh, there was a PCB dump there for a while and they did a soil uh, maintenance. Um, they took a lot of the soil away. And uh, obviously, you know, we all have concerns. So we did start testing there. We have not found anything, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything. There's a lot of wells to be tested. Does that answer most of it? And, and to, any more questions for Ms. MJ here? Yeah, one more. Yeah. I guess uh, it helps. Oh, yeah. We would love any day. We scrub it. Okay, it's reality. Test it. And you could ask people if they mind if we have it. I know everyone's information, but no one else does. We did everything by number. You see, we have a sample test over here, and everything's done by number. So nobody knows who anybody is except for me. And then here, yes, Capital Region, yeah, right. yeah, and um, uh, so we. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. So I think Martin. Uh, would you like to, do you have some things to add maybe? Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> so we have some brochures up front. I'm addressing coliform, <clears throat> um, just the basics on test your well, and roadside springs, um, okay. which I know is an issue yeah. around here. Uh, I'm more happy to answer any questions about treatment or testing results. Uh, we also have <clears throat> a sanitary seal well, head cap. This is what everyone should have. Um, you know, we get a lot of sources of coliform come from wells in our property. And if someone wants to take a look at this, you can see how it seals tightly over the well casing, and that there's venting here that's um, covered by mesh, metal mesh, to keep anything from going in. chart. So we do have a um, testing program, but it's currently not in this. I'm 
well repair program, but it's currently not in this county yet. Um, we are looking into that. Um, I could give this one away. <laughs> Do you have any idea what that would retail for? Yeah, so these are, uh, I bought this from Granger on 60. I just bought one from Granger too, right? Oh, was it? It's about the same. And um, they're right up in um, about 155. I think they'll go and do and they'll pick them up. Yeah, you we're must, happy to answer any questions. You must know the answer to the question I put to Peg. That is to say, have the tests uh, substantially changed in the last number of years? You know, there's the because most people when you buy a house, that was my impression, have an inspection that they include the water. I think most often it's just a coliform test. So, so one of the curious things that uh, Peg and I are finding out when, when we go out on a testing run is pretty much. 99% of the people in the homes we go to test have never done a test. So this is a uh, wonderful opportunity for the town to, to get their loans uh, as a start. You know, for the things that we would test for, uh, it's something that's really worthwhile. And if you do test positive for coliform, it's not a, a big deal. You know, we've tested hundreds of wells personally throughout the state. And the average is about 40% of homes with coliform positive. It's a range. And what's the E. coli average? The coli is pretty low, it's 6% of what we've seen. Um, if you find the coli, that's something you definitely need to address right away. There are several ways to address positive coliform wells, depending on your situation and your, your other analytes. We suggest annually. Um, if you do get a good result, you might delay it for a year or two, but to be safe, we definitely recommend doing it. How about, how about testing in this area for things like um, metal? I can answer that. The general recommendation for well testing for bacteriological contaminants like alpha coli is once a year. But for everything else, it's usually like three years, three or four years, something like that. Because alpha contamination is a lot more variable. It's, that can come from human sources and animals and stuff like that. The heavy metal stuff can be consistent in the area over the year. Well, most, most of us have very hard work. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, so that's because of minerals, right? It's usually carbonate. Uh, Let's scale. Right. And, and as far as testing for other things, again, we rely on you guys. If you're having a concern or we know where you live, we may investigate it. Or if you know something happened there 10 years ago, we rely on you. We really need that. You know, citizen science stuff to the test, and we will make a determination as to what to test for. You know, we like I said, we started some PCB testing. We do this physical and chemical analysis, which the list is on the back of the handout, and so that's what this test is: all of the physical and chemical, color, turbidity, odor, those things. But if you are concerned, if there was a battery factory, we don't really know very much going on in New Lebanon in our research. That doesn't mean things didn't happen. We don't. We have a pretty low PFAS concern at the moment. That doesn't mean there isn't something going on. We just haven't found it. The only thing that was found was in 2019, they tested the wells on the uncapped landfill. Uh, the DEC tested those and those did show PFAS and they tested all the houses down gradient twice over a two year period and nothing showed up in any of the houses. There was nothing. Um, so we're working with Dean Barrett to get that landfill, uh, that quote thing closed, but you know, so far it has, we haven't gotten it closed. The high school did test positive. We have no idea what the source is. No one does. They put in filtration. They have mitigated that. But when there is a concern, we will go out and test. That's what we're here for. We really need to know what's going on in town. We need to get a handle on it. And nothing's really been done all these years. So it's a few things under the under the bridge. So how long will we have? Where is the, the excuse me? Where is the landfill? Because a lot of it, at least I. I 
Oh, so behind the school. high school? Behind the high school? Yeah. How long will the ARPA funds hold out? Until we use them up. We got about $20,000 left. We spent about ten. And then the idea with this, all this is to trying to explain to everybody is once we get our implementation plan um, satisfied to the DEC, um, then we can apply for more money for more testing, which is really important. So we're really working hard with the DEC to try to get them to approve our plan. So, um, so you guys have any? Yes. Yeah. So um, I have I did my own test in the second test, but just the tricks saw the results. I don't know. I did. I showed it to you. Okay. But um, and uh, apparently people think. We have cars that people sell here in the creek with dry our house, old cars, and various other people are built in the They're all smashed up. They're from like the 30s and 40s. Um, and so that's maybe where the feedback is coming from. I don't know. But I, I got a, a filter, but I haven't tested the water from the filter. Can you do that? We'll talk I'm about it. Let's talk about it. Yes. Working. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay, great. You want to, yes. Are we going to get into stocking our wells? I, I, I think hope. Martin just covered it, but oh. well, we have some yes. um, advice on our website about shocking and calculating how much to how much bleach you need to use, the steps you need to do to make sure it's safely. To mix the bleach with water before you pour it in. You also want to make sure that water doesn't go into your septic. But we have um, some advice. You don't want to use old tanks. Easy to bring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, since water is going to be coming, hot water will be going through uh, toilets and. All, there's no real way to keep it out of septic. Well, you, if you can, you need to figure out a way to flush some of the most of the outlets. Like okay, yeah. We can help. We can help you with that. Yeah. We can help you figure that out. All in, yeah. uh, So you mentioned earlier UV or UV treatment. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe how much? That would cost for just a whole a regular private home, and then at what point that gets applied, you know, at the well point, at the top point, how that works. Can you get into that? So usually, once the water comes into the house, right after, after, the, after the pressure tank, there'll be a there'll be a filter put in to keep the sediment out, and then you'll have the UV light system um, that can the light bulb and then a quartz sleeve. That you Periodically, those systems can be installed depending on your existing plumbing equipment and electrical setup. Seven hundred to twelve hundred dollars um, to maintain those fairly inexpensive. And buying new filters varies on how often the water is. So some people might need to change those every few months. Some people would be okay to change them once a year. Uh, keeping the bulb clean. And then replacing that bulb uh, in recommended year. There's also chlorine as another option, depending on what's coming in. There's a lot of sediment, there's a lot of iron. There's several options. Is there a certain distance between the well and the septic tank that makes it? There is, I think it's, um, you know, I'm talking about, how's it, 200 feet between the well and the septic? It depends on where you live. But a lot of the, the mm -hmm. problem is with really, with older, like, towns and the older homes, so you can have septic and wells right on top of each other, and your neighbor's septic is right on next to your well. And, so in the, um, in the plan, there's a uh, sheet. If you have the plan, it's online again. Um, what page is that? There you go. 
Uh, so on page 30, this is the uh, New York State Sanitary Code, so um, part five sheet for their advisements for how far you should, um, what distances from your well for certain um, types of things you might have in your yard. So this is in the plan, there's um, a sheet that outlines you know, distances from different things like dog poop. <laughs> dog poop's a big deal, actually. If you, I have a neighbor who their dog goes out every morning and pees on the lawn. Like, so, <laughs> what website is that? Page 30. What website is the that? Yeah. 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 The, the plan. Yeah, I know. It's funny mm -hmm. unless you're making your yeah. eyes. But, um, I did, I did not mention one thing about the, the plan and the implementation is um, working with DOT. So we're interested in working with DOT in the future to find ways to potentially, anything you can do to mitigate the um, uh, de-icing activities and... Um, Good question. Is the warm mineral spring in Lebanon Springs on the radar at all for DOH? from other agencies and for quality of water there, which the spring is currently shut down and it cuts speed houses below the spring and other water runs off into the right over off the block. So is is that being addressed at all? Is it under private ownership, yeah. something like that? Yes. That's that complicates things private ownership is uh I think technically, from our perspective, roadside springs, we would just uh, recommend nobody drink it. But the fact that it's a private ownership spring that's feeding houses below it, I remember we, we were here in 2021, I think, there were some houses that had the piping still set up, but they had it capped off in their homes, so they weren't drinking that water. But it's the problem is, too, is Piping is so old, and I don't think anything is very well documented from what we learned speaking to people around here. So um, it's hard to tell which homes are actually. Good. I don't know if that's. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a, it's actually you know as you know Karen a complicated issue and it's something we're going to need to address. We started to address it. Um, the DOH typically hasn't really wanted to. They they kind of put it back on us to kind of figure out how we're going to address it. It has to be addressed. Uh, because it's on private land now, um, and it, it is a CEA now, so it is a critical environmental area, the Springs is, so that's a good thing, um, but it's something that has to be addressed, and it's kind of been punted around, and we know we have to address it. Is that on the county's radar? We think so. Okay, so, yeah, so we're going to move on to Tyler's part, and then you guys can have the floor again. Or do you have anything more to say? Okay, good. We'll move on to Tyler. He's going to cover a little bit about wells and things, and you guys can jump in too. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. Hey everybody. I'm Tyler. It's a good conversation that's been started about, especially with um, septics and wells and proximity and stuff like that. No, just for the video. Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a lot of this might be just kind of common knowledge information, but it's stuff that uh, we've been put through the uh, the School of Home Ownership the last couple of years with our well, so I thought we could share just some things that I learned. And um, hopefully it's all right. If not, then you're helping me develop my public school. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were talking about the wellhead, um, and then uh, this is basic diagrams. And we have uh, well pumps that are like in their basement, as opposed to in the bottom of the well. Sometimes, sometimes set shallow wells will have. We see the wells. Yeah, yeah. So that doesn't, that's not represented here, but this is, have, um, we have a really deep wells, 500 plus feet, um, and uh, the pump at the bottom, and uh, when it turns on, it, it has some trickle force applied to it, and it actually applies it to the well line, so a torque eraser can help um, mitigate that uh, action on the on the well line and help preserve that. Um, mm -hmm. Pressure switch turns the pump on and off, and then uh, your pressure tank. Um, you're not short cycling the pump because you don't want the pump to turn on and off every time there's a you turn that your your water on. It's so important to make that things. Yeah, we're talking about um, again test, testing your water is the best way to ensure that water remains 
um, annually as possible. Um, we were talking about the well cap issue, um, making sure that it's, it's sealed against nutrients, but also as air flow and ventilation to keep the pressure inside your well the same pressure. Um, you know, setting setting back a waste and other fertilizer, um, like landscaping stuff. I don't know stuff like that. I guess. And then um, pay attention to any changes in the character of your water, um, changes in flavor, or smell, or if it's starting to leave stains. Things like that. That's thirty what? Thirty feet. Thirty feet. And again, th there's there might be other information in that packet about different. Uh, distances for different types of fossil contaminants. So, uh, refer to that for a better description. Um, basic diagram of, of how your septic field and tank and your well might interact. Uh, we were talking just a minute ago about not interact. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, just about, you know, these guys are saying how close sometimes your well and your septic field can be. Um, and so, making sure that. Working at the way that it's intended to, so it doesn't affect the future. Um, we're talking about applying your pressure, your uh, well pump. That's more about um, saving money down the road if not have to replace uh, a well pump. Um, taking care of your septic tank and drain field by avoiding, uh, bad, you know, putting bad things into that system. The only things that's going to go in there are toilet paper and, and uh, <clears throat> waste, avoiding uh, grease and oil, other um, solids from uh, garbage disposal are all things that can interrupt the your septic and drain field operating. Um, using less water, you know, it puts less strain on your septic tank and field, um, and more easier for it to, to Treat the water that's going in, and uh, I mean, absolutely. Um, then having your tank pumped regularly, and um, avoiding uh, forward activity on your on your grain field, like tree, you know, planting trees or driving on and stuff like that. They're usually pretty gentle, but a couple feet where the the um, the up to those. Um, Good background. Yes. Specifically, how many feet out from the septic does the drain field go? Um, I think it depends on the size of your septic system. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have? Yeah, if you're, depends on proximity to lakes and streams as well. Um. Your question is how far away from the tank are the lines? Yeah, so because I want to plant trees, I want to plant them on the septic field. So I'm just the old, old system. So yeah. I'm guessing, I don't know how to. We, we, we had our septic field at our house um, sur surveyed um, and plotted, and it wasn't, you know, I, don't, I forget what it cost, but that's, I, I don't want to give recommendations because I'm not a, an expert. But that's that's what I would do. If you're, I think it's also just good to know where your septic field is, because uh, at our house for a years, it wasn't where we thought it was. <laughs> so, it's always nice to know. Uh, roofs can do a lot of damage to those elements. Instead of the septic field, uh, we discussed the use of dry well. Ed, you know it. Do you guys know about dry well? We'll have to look that up. Email us. Email us, please. We will get the information. Okay. Well, I have one. Oh, okay. I'm asking. I did too. Yeah. Anything else? Those are my four slides. That's so, it. no one else has any other questions for Tyler on this or any of these experts? Yeah, Chris. I've always been told that it's important for the um, Septic field to keep the grass at a like a certain level so that you can um, 
um, as part of the um, so basically mm -hmm. is is it recommend is that still the recommendation? Can I let my center field get high or metal on it? Can I you know, what what can I do with my center? Because as Martin said deep roots are damage that system. So, and, uh, you know, certain grass species, can have, even grasses can have very deep roots. So. Oh, over the summer, I have. <laughs> <laughs> very fertile soil. A second question I had is, um, is it possible to use part of the subject field as um, thinking about Oh, it's solar, but I assume I don't want to shade. I'm not sure. I, I um, as far as like liquid from your septic field having the ability to evaporate as opposed to drain into the ground, I'm not sure what the what the possible benefits. Also, yeah, right. Yeah, you definitely don't want to have like the foundation of the panel. Yeah. So if your field fails, you have to dig up your whole field, yeah. and line it, and then yeah. dig up the solar panels out. So, good points. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, sure thing. Sure. Just like it sounds. La Mama. Yes. And you can always get in touch with Marcy or any of us on the CAC. Okay. All of our our names are all on the town website who was on the CAC. And our emails are all NLCAC dot our name. Except for Bill, but we won't talk about Bill. Uh -huh. But um, you can reach out and, and Marcy can also get it to us. We're very available. I'm also in the phone book. So um, uh, any uh, other final, did you guys want to say, the DOH guys want to say anything else? Did you want to add anything that you thought of that while we were talking? I would just say volunteer to have your own. Stand up and say that, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, volunteer and tell your neighbors. You know, we also get a lot out of this as well. Because we get to enter people's homes and ask them questions. History, you know, to every well set up. It's a lot to learn that information with the town as well. When in the spring is it starting? April. Yeah. April. Yeah. Early. April. So, and I'll explain again one more time how we do it. So we collect names, and then if we have at least nine, we get in touch with people and offer a time, and we usually give a window of time, and then we'll come and test, and we'll get you the results as soon as we can, and only you and I get those results. You're free to share them. We just don't, unless you say it's okay to share them. We haven't had the need. But if the DOH guys, we're doing a citizen science project with them, so they get the results as well. This is all just to compile data. We have very little data on New Lebanon, so we're starting from scratch, basically, but we're getting there. So we do have some well yield information. You guys remember about 10 years ago, there was a postcard about well yields, and so that was for this study. And so we have those uh, put in on this map. But in general, um, you know, we really need your help and your information to point us into where to test. You know, there's things that have been dumped that we don't even know about, um, similar to what Kathy was saying about the cars in her stream. There's lots of stuff going on, lots of old things. So we really do want to get a handle on it and we want everyone to be safe. And we just want to assure you there's nothing to be worried about. Knowledge is helpful. Knowledge is power. We don't want you to be worried. But I do encourage people if they test a couple times for coliform and even E. coli especially, you're going to have to boil your water anyway with the coliform and wait a couple weeks to test. But I encourage everyone to get a UV filter and contemplate it. That's the direction we're going with the water table being high. Last year we had a huge amount of water. There was a lot of water moving around. There were suggestions on local media about commercial testing. Courses. Right, so okay. thanks for bringing that up. I just want to reiterate again. Uh, we do the testing through Capital Region Environmental. We do, we're doing this to get the information that we need to help you and to give a picture of the town for the future. 
you guys are free to go and test your own on your own and we would love to have that information but we won't pay for anybody's test that we don't actually do the test ourselves so someone did contact me right after they were tested in november our last date was at the end of november and they wanted another test and i said i'm very sorry we're not doing it again until april if you want to bring one in if you're having a concern i will come and test if you drive it to rensselaer it's an hour and a half drive there and back we are volunteers so we don't drive for one test i apologize for that but that's just the way it is we will drive for nine or ten tests they have to be you have to sterilize where you're testing you have to run the water and put it in a secure sample in a in a, in a sample a container that the lab provides and it has to be chilled and there's only a very small amount of time we have to get those tests over which is why we do it this way so i know it seems a little cumbersome but it's worked pretty well so far for 70 tests and we make every effort to accommodate okay. any other okay any other questions Email us, we will help you. Right. <laughs> <laughs>